Lord forgive me for this trap shit Sergeant Smack make it backflip Telly hanged it with the action With the vital speaking Spanish Frank Matthews how I vanish Poof Came back like I'm King Tut Go BBS is on a beamer When Fat Cat was tearing queens up Fall off the profit not the re-up Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus Uptown like I'm Baby Main Just caught a touchdown From the Bay I got involved in the hustle game when I was about 12 years old at a very young age. And um, I have like five brothers and two sisters. And my oldest brother was the vice president of a local street gang called uh, uh, Cold Spring Manhattan Lovers. His name was Iceberg. And I had another brother by the name of Gary and another brother by the name of Ronnie. The other brother was too really young to understand what was going on. And uh, what my brother would do, the rest of call is from a federal prison. Me and my other brothers would follow my older brother, Iceberg, and whatever he done. Now, like I said, at the time I was like 12, my other brother was like, Ronnie was like 11, and Gary, he was like 13 at the time. And so when my brother became a vice president of a gang, then me and my other little brothers would follow behind him and we would get in the game. And so as time went on, probably about a year or two as that went on, my brother stopped being in the game and he became a hustler. He started hustling in the streets, selling drugs. So he would give me a number like one and one, my other little brother a number two and two, and then Ronnie a number three and three. So if he said one and one, that meant bringing one bundle of dope. If you said two and two, that means bringing two bundles of dope from Gary or Ronnie. If you said three and three, that means Ronnie are bringing three bundles of dope. So he stopped being a gang leader. He started being a drug dealer. Mm. So as time went on, then he started hustling. He started having girlfriends and he became a pimp. And so I had an aunt, I got two aunts that was prostitutes. And one of them was very pretty, and she used to have a pimp, and she stopped being with her pimp, and she would take me with her. She had a, a Broham Cadillac at the time. This was a long time ago. I was about 13 now. And what she would do is she would go out on Chippewa, she would go up in Niagara Falls, and she would prostitute. And what she would do is keep me inside a restaurant, and I would drink orange juice and eat candy bars and stuff like that. And she, every time she get money, she would bring me the money to hold for her. Then she would take me all over the city, take me to Niagara Falls, and take me everywhere. I really didn't see anything wrong with any of this because I was so young at the time, and I really didn't understand what was going on. And it was seven of us, so my mother was kind of young when she had so many kids. So my mother, my grandmother, and my aunt took care of all seven of us. My grandmother took some of us, my aunt took some of us, and some of us stayed with my mother because my mother was a very young lady mm -hmm. at that time and she was very pretty, but she had seven kids. So she'd be out, you know, in bars or clubs or something, things like that. And she really didn't have time for seven kids, I would assume. Mm. But she'd done the best she could under the circumstances. And so as time went on, my older brother Iceberg would tell us, the younger brothers, don't never tell on nobody, don't never snitch on nobody. If you see things in the streets, you don't say them. You leave the streets where the streets is at. That's how I got into it. I admire what I saw inside the streets. I became the streets, and by me being around my aunt and by me being around my older brother, you know, I, I love the streets. I love what I've seen in the streets. And so I began to live in the streets and skip school and, you know, be around my aunt or try to hang around my older brother. And I just became fascinated with the streets because of what the streets represented and what I've seen in the streets and through my aunt and my older brother. And my brother was like a local legend at that time in the streets. He made a lot of money. Uh, he stayed very well dressed. And, you know, we just wanted to be like our brother. Me and my little younger brothers, we seen what he done. And we just followed behind him, and we wanted to be like him. Mm. And so we followed behind him. And everything he did, we tried to emulate, and we tried to do. So I became street poison. 
I became the streets, I became like the streets, and I became obligated to the streets. You know, and I didn't want to do nothing else but be in the streets because that's what I, I grew up seeing. My older brother and my aunt in the streets. Yeah, yeah, we back. Show boy pop a lot. Mob, mob, mob. We on our way to New York with it. We headed upstate. The Queen City. Buffalo. Shout out to all my people in Buffalo. Y'all get in the comment box. It's been long overdue. I know y'all been waiting. Now, today, we are going to be covering the top shotter to ever come out of the city of Baltimore. If I'm lying, y'all get in the comment box and dispute this fact. We are going to be covering none other than the infamous Donald Sly Green. And we also going to talk about his alleged cohorts who the media dubbed the L.A. boys. Now, before we get all the way into it about Sly, I want to talk a little bit about the Queen City. Now, I was on Clubhouse probably about a couple weeks ago. I happened to be in one of the rooms and I was answering questions. And I got a question from a dude from Buffalo. And after I answered the question, we went off topic for a little bit. And he would go on to say how Buffalo did not get their respect. Buffalo needs to be more well known. And I had to tell him a story about the time that I visited Buffalo. And it opened my eyes about the city for real, for real. Because like I explained to him, it was one of those situations where if somebody would have blindfolded me in Brooklyn and took me to these projects that I was in in Buffalo and took the blindfolds off, I would have never known I was out of Brooklyn because that shit was wild. And you don't got to believe my story. You don't have to look no further than the story of Donald Sly Green to tell you how wild Buffalo is and was. Now, based on all my research, Donald Sly Green came up in Buffalo and he got into the game through his older brother, who was a big time or semi big time hustler getting money at that time. He would also say that he learned a lot of the game from one of his aunts who he would go out with. And as she would perform certain tricks, she would leave him in a diner and he would be ordering orange juices and probably chocolate milks, the shit that kids do. And if I'm not mistaken, he said that he would go on to hold her money. So just that alone is a recipe or like a blueprint to groom somebody to the streets. And he also has several brothers that was in the streets as well. But Donald would go on to make a name for himself as top gangster in the city. And according to authorities, his reign is going to be right from around the early to mid 80s to the mid 90s, right around 1994. And it's said that he would go on to introduce the city to shit that they never seen before. It was alleged that he would import killers from Los Angeles, which he refuted, as well as kidnappings and also being charged with running a conspiracy from behind the walls, almost sort of like the same situation that they caught Rayful Edmonds in. The only difference between him and Rayful is he kept his mouth shut. His name and organization would be mentioned with a slew of murders and violent acts, but the most important one occurred in October of 1988, and that would be the murder of Larnell Cottrell, and that would have him on trial in February of 1991 in a very high profile trial that would lead the Star Gazette to write an article titled Decoys Assist as Gang Bosses Jailed. And they would go on to say that law enforcement officials were so worried about an attempt or attempts to free Sly after he was convicted of that October 1988 murder. The Star Gazette would report that they would 
fly him in by helicopter while they drove three decoy vehicles with lookalikes just in case it was any attempts to break him out. Now, with most people, that would be the end of the story because you have to look at it. He was just convicted of an execution-style murder. And this was only after he started his life of crime very, very early. One thing I don't want to leave out that I'm sure had a huge effect on him besides the influence of his brother and his aunt that I spoke about earlier, it was going to be a botched robbery that he was involved with as a teen where a shop owner was killed. So that is the lifespan of a human, almost two people. And that would not be it because in 1994, where he would be charged with using a phone in order to run a conspiracy that would lead to his wife, his cousin, and I want to say his brother testifying against him. It was even said that prosecutors had a list of up to 250 witnesses that they might call to testify against him. One of the 250 people on that witness list was a long distance swimmer by the name of Charles Chapman or Charlie the Tuna. And he would happen to be the first black to swim the English Channel. So you really couldn't make this shit up. During the trial, prosecutors would charge that he would order everything from drug dealings to kidnappings to murders directly from his prison cell. At that federal trial, prosecutors would allege that Sly Green's gang shot and killed a drug rival with machine guns on Christmas Eve of 1991 and kidnapped another drug dealer for a $250,000 ransom which I want to say that Sly Green and his gang made popular because it was a time very close to when all of this was going on where drug dealers were being kidnapped in Buffalo. With all of that being in the play, on March 30th, 1994, a jury would return a guilty verdict against Green for racketeering conspiracy, narcotics conspiracy, as well as engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise. At his trial, the government would go on to depict Sly Green as the leader of the LA Boys and would say that he orchestrated the enterprise's activities and he would go on to be sentenced to four concurrent life sentences, two concurrent 20 year sentences, a 10 year concurrent sentence, 15 concurrent four-year sentences, all to follow his unexpired New York State murder sentence that he was already facing. So they pretty much did everything to bury him, put him in two graves. That just goes to show you the impact that he had on Buffalo and the fear that they had of him. Shit, we didn't have to look no further than the first trial when they was flying him in by helicopter and using decoy vehicles. So he was definitely a big deal in the city. I don't know nothing bigger. If y'all know any, y'all get in the comment box and I'm still going to challenge it. I just want to see what y'all talking about. But y'all already know what it is with me. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. We going to be back with some more real trill spill shit. Y'all make sure y'all hit the red subscribe right under this video so y'all know when it's dropping. And we are on a quest to cover every gangster, everywhere, anywhere. And y'all let us know where we need to go, who we missed, what we need to cover, and we gonna be right there. It's your boy Pop-A-Lot. Mob, mob, mob.